All right, good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, my name is David McLeod. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I am so excited that there's people in this room. This is, this is great. And so um, today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 11, and, uh, and I would ask you to do this if you can. Um, we don't have Bibles in the pews anymore uh, because, um, you know, COVID, right? But if you have your phone, please track along with me. Romans chapter 11 is an interesting chapter. Uh, this week I had a great opportunity. I looked back into some seminary notes uh, that I took over a decade ago. And um, I thought, I, I was really working hard to understand this passage. Because if you read it, you see it's difficult. This, there's a lot of really, really important themes here uh, that really sort of uh, like necessitate us spending more time looking at. Um, I only have 20 minutes today. And so I'm going to try to really be focused, but I'd encourage you to do this, to really delve into this chapter, to really look at it. But those sermon, those uh, seminary notes that I had at the top of it, it said Romans chapter 11. And it was a quote from my professor, the hardest chapter in the Bible. So, um, so today I'm going to preach on that. I'm going to apologize to Worth for whatever I did, you know. And um, if you have any questions, if you have any questions as you go through this, um, uh, the email you want to send the questions to is worth at Granada PCA.org. All right. So uh, anything you have, you send it to him. Uh, but I'm super excited. I love this chapter and, and studying it this week. And I think it goes a little bit uh, to something very important. And I think Julietta's video is, 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 was really key for us to understand where we're going to start today. It is about who you are, your spiritual DNA as a human being. Your soul matters. Your soul is something that God gave you. And today we're going to look deeply into like what it means to be us. What is your spiritual DNA? And a few years ago, there was a, a, a phenomenon, I would say, with 23andMe. Now, how many of you did 23andMe or, or Ancestry.com? Like, raise your hand if we're allowed to do that, right? Okay. I did it too. It was really interesting. My I, uh, McLeod is definitely Scottish, all right? So I had that. I knew that was coming. Uh, Welsh and Jewish and even a little bit of West African. Like, how does this happen, Right. But if you took a little bit of time, if you did the 23 and me, you found like, this is where you came from. This is, this is in a way who you are. And you can imagine for a second what that journey must have been like. If you look back over, like, how did I get here? How did I, what, what were my ancestors like? And 23 and me really took off. I mean, there were commercials constantly and people were comparing it. And, you know, you'd get the kit in the mail and you'd take a little bit of the, uh, the cells out of your, uh, your cheek. Not really COVID friendly, I would assume at this point. But whatever the case, that's what we were doing. I look at Romans chapter 11 today in a similar vein. Where did you come from? What's your spiritual DNA? And I want to delve into this chapter today and specifically look at verses 17, 18, and 20 to really understand this is who you are. This is, this is as whether you're from a Jewish background, whether you're uh, from a Gentile background, I think that Paul is helping us understand here, this is who you are as a person. You, know, you have to appreciate the Apostle Paul and the way that he writes because I've noticed in studying him over a period of time, you'll notice that whenever it's a really challenging or difficult subject, Paul does something to help us understand. He gives us a metaphor. He gives us an allegory. Uh, he gives us an analogy to help us connect a little bit deeper. And that's what he does in this passage. He helps us to see who we are. And he gives us a gardening, a horticulture reference to help drive home the point so we understand what's happened, what God's plan is for each one of us. And I think it's beneficial. It's really important for us to look at this. And I think individually, we look at it, and, and corporately as a church, we look at this because I think it reveals a lot to us, not just to understand the knowledge part, where we are and who we are, but I think it also has a very, very deep heart impact on us when we see what God has done what he is doing and what he will do for us 
for his kingdom and the future. And that's why I believe Romans 11 today is so important. And this metaphor that Paul uses is grafting. Now, grafting is probably something that many of you do not do. All right. How many gardeners do we have? Probably a few. My wife loves to garden. Our house is full of greenery, all sorts of plants. Uh, we're on a first name basis with, uh, with the nursery near our house. And our house is alive. It's full. But we know this. If you cut a branch, it's not go going to last for very long. It's gonna, it's after a while it wilts and, and it's gone, it's time to replace it. But grafting is something interesting. Grafting is when you take a plant, you cut it off, you match it up with a plant that's connected to a root system, to a trunk that has nutrition. Grafting then, if it takes, will allow that branch that was moved in to live, to flourish, to eventually create fruit. And so Paul uses this, and he uses the imagery here of an olive tree. Now, to the original audience who would have been hearing this, an olive tree was very much part of their culture. An olive tree represented so many different things. It represented sustenance, because those olives, uh, that, that amazing product of the tree provided them with, with the oil that they would need. But the tree also had a huge longevity of life. And that tree represented in many ways like an enormous amount of future at the same time. And an olive tree has amazing root systems. And it would have been known by the readers of that time that an olive tree represented not just longevity and, and sustenance, but it also represented something that they saw every day in their life. And I think Paul always grounded his readers to things that they would see on a regular basis. So imagine you just heard this letter, you just uh, heard this analogy shared, and you walk past an olive tree, and it all comes back to you. Paul does this kind of thing. But he talks about an olive tree to, I believe, share with you information about our identity, our spiritual DNA as people, how we came to be. How God moved throughout history to preserve and rescue us as a people because of the cross. So today, look at this a little bit deeper, okay? Let's start at verse 17 today. Let's look at this olive tree. Let's look at this analogy and see what God has for you and for me today. Verse 17 says this. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you... Though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over these branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. The first thing today is we understand this idea of spiritual DNA, understanding our identity is this. Number one, as a Gentile you are grafted in. We are a grafted people. So if you think for just a moment what this actually means is that you have to go way back in the Old Testament to understand a little bit about God's covenant people, the Israelites, the Jewish people. God selected them. He chose them to be his covenant people. His covenant people means he made promises to them throughout their history and he preserved and he protected he admonished and he chastised, but they were his people. And you see a bond that was created because God is good. God chose a group of people to show his love, his grace, and who he is. So what these verses are bringing out is God grafted a whole group of people, people that are not of a Jewish background, into the tree into the sustenance. And we all know that a tree, a, a branch, cannot live unless it is sustained by the trunk and by the roots. And so Paul's telling us, this is how God worked. This is who you are. God brought you in as a believer. He brought you in and you are grafted into this tree, grafted into these promises, grafted into the covenant that God had made. And he calls us, his people. So the first thing to understand about our spiritual DNA is this, that we are grafted in. So when you look back over all of the promises that God has made to his people, because of what Paul says, you can say as a believer, those are promises that are directed at me. Those are covenants that God has made with his people. And Paul is telling us here, that's who you are. 
As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are grafted in. You are the wild shoot. You are the olive branch that was put in. That now has life and sustenance because of the roots, because of the trunk. I think of that for just a moment. What an act of God's grace. You learn a little bit about God here and what he does and how he works because you know this. You didn't merit any of that kind of love or care, but it was freely given to us by God's choice and sacrifice through Jesus Christ. The branch has no way to decide where it's grafted in at, but rather Paul brings out here that it was intentional, that God did it. You were brought in. You were grafted in to God's tree. Several years ago, Michael Miller, if you remember him, Michael is out in Texas and a great friend of mine. And we went out after Hurricane Irma. We went all around and we were helping uh, homes that, uh, of people that maybe couldn't clean up their yard. And I, it sticks with me very much one thing I saw that day was that we were just a day after Irma had come through the gables and many of the tree branches that were on the ground that we were moving into brush piles, they were already dead. They were already like turning brown and, and the leaves were wilting. And it was such a vivid imagery for me to really think about this passage today is that the grafting that God has done is what brings us life. We don't create life on our own. We are in need of his sustenance and his giving and his sacrifice in each one of our lives. And just like we know that a branch cannot survive for, for, for time off of the trunk, we as people, it is the same. And if we're understanding our spiritual DNA, if we're understanding who we are as people and about our soul, understand this. This is the work that God did in each one of our lives, that he took us and he has given us life by his grace. So the first thing I want us to see today is you are a grafted people as believers in Christ. The second thing I want us to see today is you are rooted and that is where life comes from. Look at, look at verse 18 with me, if you will, for just a moment. This is what God's word says. It says in verse 18, Do not boast over the branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Something interesting here about this tree that Paul is bringing up. There's two major things, two verbs that are happening. The way that we read here in the NIV, this is the, 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 what I'm reading out of, it talks about branches being broken off. Other translations use a word called pruning, all right? Most of you have done some pruning. If you have a yard, you've done some pruning where, where at one point during the season, you'll take out some, let's say, uh, quote unquote, unwanted vines or, or something that's not producing fruit. You remove those and it allows for more growth to happen. Now, Paul uses this here to not only use the word pruning, the verb pruning, but he also uses the word grafting to show us what's happening. And there was a pruning that happened in God's covenant family that was, that was in, in, in many ways, I think it's difficult for us to even imagine, to, for us to even think about. It's a harsh sort of reality. But there was a group that was broken or pruned off of the tree. And it brings us to some other, it brings us to a place for each one of us to think about that there was a point in Israel's history where they actually rejected God's grace, where there was disobedience and God had been extending himself in such an incredible way and bringing rescue and faith and hope to them as a group. And there were people within that group, within that community who rejected that message. So God cut them out. There was a point here in history where there was people that just rejected what God had offered and had given to them as people. And you think about that as, man, what a, what, a, what, a, what a sad moment. What a difficult place to be at. And you read through these things and, and you think of broken and pruning. And it's a harsh reality. But what happens is it wasn't because of an ethnicity but it was because of people's choices. They rejected what God had for them. They rejected his love and his mercy and his grace in their lives. And at some point, they were let go. Now the question of chapter 11, the whole point of chapter 11, you see in verse 1. And Paul asks a very, very important question to people that were listening, both Gentile and Jewish. He asked this. I asked then, did God reject his people? 
Did God let go of his people? And the answer in the affirmative is this, that no way did God reject his people. But there were people that chose something other than him. I think it shows us the depravity, the, the, the sin of the human heart, that when God is offering something so free, he's offering his grace, he's offering himself, he's choosing a people to himself. There's a possibility of rejection of that gift. And those branches are pruned off. Those branches are broken off. And God brings in a grafting. God brings in a grafting of a wild olive branch. And it's put in. And so Paul is opening this up. And he's bringing it to us to see that this is something incredibly important. But he shows us the trunk and then he drives us down to see the roots and we, knew that, we know that no tree exists without root system. A root system is what brings all of those different chemicals and all of that sustenance so that the tree can live. And the second thing I want us to see today is not only are you grafted, but you are a rooted. As a believer, you are rooted and understand what the root actually is. The root is Jesus Christ. The root is what gives us life as people. It's what gives us life so that you and I can have hope today. We are a rooted people. And when you look at these verses, Paul is so kind to us. Because not only does he show how we're rooted and and what we're rooted in. But he also admonishes us against pride. But we are rooted. And I thought for a while this last week, if you really connect with what it means to be rooted, I think three things really come up. You realize that you have been given a gift of grace that comes only from God. And I think it brings three different things to our hearts, or it should bring three things to our hearts. The first is this. It should bring us to a place of gratitude. Because we realize in the moment that we are people that we could not do this for ourselves. And Paul drives us to that to see it. Is that you can't give yourself life just like a plant cannot live without its roots. We can't do that as people either we are dependent so the first is gratefulness that God is so kind to us that God is so good to us as people that he has done this for us so I think it brings us to a place of gratefulness the second thing I want you to see is I think it brings us to a place of humility if you think about it if you think about the idea of grafting if you think about the idea of being chosen about being set apart, but by being a part of God's family, I think it brings you to a place of humility. You know, and humility is something I think is so lacking in our world today. It's something we don't think about often. I think oftentimes we're jockeying more for position. We're jockeying more to be, to be known and to be relevant and all of these kinds of things. But we forget what it means to be a child of God. We forget what had to be done on our behalf to, for us to be called sons and daughters of his. I think we forget sometimes what it cost him, what it cost Jesus Christ on the cross. And we're bought with a price. And the price was his life. When you really start to consider that this isn't something you could do for yourself, when you really start to consider that this isn't something that you could earn, that you could, could buy, this is something that had to be done for you. And whatever walk of life that you are in, I think it drives you for a moment to honest humility. We're not better than anyone else. We are a family of people who are connected because of what Christ did. And we serve and love and care for each other. Which is really the third thing I see that comes out when you really, really dig into very deeply this idea of being rooted. I think the third thing is it shows how connected that we are as people. Because you think about this for a second. It's so nice to have people in the room. But you look around. And as believers, as professing people of Jesus Christ, we are a family. We all have had to come to a place of admitting that we could not do this ourselves. That that we were powerless. That it had to happen through Jesus Christ. That we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And only because of his grace that we could be part and call ourselves sons and daughters of his. You look around for just a moment. We're connected as a family. We are people who have had to confess the exact same thing. And I think of it sort of like this. Connected by blood, not really, but maybe. All right? 
We're connected actually by Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. His blood that was shed is what gives us forgiveness. We are a family that is united because of Christ's blood. I see that and I think, yes, it should drive us to gratitude for God's grace. It should make us more humble in the way that we deal with ourselves and with other people. But I think also we realize how connected we are. Do you realize what it means to be a spiritual family? Because part of your spiritual DNA is understanding you are part of a spiritual family that God has brought together. And that is something to treasure. That is something to love. And it should guide us in a way that we have relationships and care for each other. The way we think about each other. The way that we challenge each other. The way that we are there for each other during difficult points within our lives. We are connected as a group of people. We are rooted, not in our own works, but we are rooted through the work and the life of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and resurrection. The final thing I want to share with us today is not just are you rooted, not just are you grafted, but finally, Paul has an admonishment. We are an admonished people because as this develops, I think some people can get a point where they look and say, I'm grafted in. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm one of God's family. And you start to look outside. You start to think about the idea of pruning of branches, of broken. And there is a serious, serious, I would say, temptation that comes up. And Paul addresses it here in Romans chapter 11. And he warns us against this. We're supposed to be grateful. We're supposed to be humble. We realize how connected we are. We don't elevate ourselves over anyone else. If you look with me just for a moment at verse 20, it says this. I'll start in verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted, granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but, be, but stand by faith and be afraid. For, it, for if God did not spare natural branches, he will not spare you. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Think for just a second. He's warning us there against arrogance. And ultimately, I believe he's warning all of us against pride. Because it can be a source of pride if you think, well, I'm part of God's family and other people are not. And Paul says this is exactly the opposite of who and what God wants. He talks about God's kindness. He talks about God's sternness. Two things that exist very, very seamlessly within him. But he warns us against pride. And I'll tell you this, and I encourage you with this, that when pride grows, when we think that we're better than someone else, when we think that we deserve things, when we become entitled as a group of people, when we become prideful, understand where pride leads Pride leads to people getting hurt. Pride leads to devastating moments within our world history. And if you even think about the roots of racism, they are founded in pride. The, 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 the exclusion, the discrimination of a person based off where they came from or what their skin color is. And I believe Paul is driving us here to see this. We have no place to stand and saying things about other people. We're a people who have been saved by grace. We're grateful. We're humbled. We realize the connectedness of the gospel. And the way that it has rescued us. We are conduits rather. Not of pride. We are conduits of God's grace to our world. And that is something every believer needs to take to heart. And I pray that God gives you eyes to see. And a heart to see that as well. And you're open to it. Is that we are called to be people of humility. We are called to be people that are grateful for what has, God has done and to show that to a world. This last week, um, a really special thing happened. Um, Jeff Sullivan was ordained as a, as, a, as, a, as a minister here at church. And you can actually watch his ordination service. It was done kind of a, a small way. But when I was going through that, um, I had an opportunity to share a little bit. And I, I, during that, I was, I was really talking about our relationships as a group of people. And there's this amazing um, verse I ran across in Thessalonians chapter 5. And it talked about three different things that really show how we are to interact, how our relationships as people should be. It was respect. Imagine that, right? Dignity 
and love and we seek out peace in our community. And I wonder if those things are true about us. What if we really are people that are really loving? What if we actually show dignity and respect to other people? And what if we live in such a way that we strive for peace? Not meaning that we don't disagree, but meaning that as a group of people, we're so committed to each other. We understand the connectedness of the family of God that we work to do whatever we can to share, to challenge, and to love each other. What an incredible thing. But when you connect a little bit with your spiritual DNA, when you really understand how you're rooted in Christ, when you really kind of delve into even, even deeper the idea of being grafted in, and you realize that Paul's admonishing us as people to be careful because he understands our hearts as people. It was his heart as well. And he needed the exact same redemptive work in his life that we do. We share that with Paul. We are a family in that sense. You really see those things. How does it change your family if those three things exist? What if you're loving? What if there's respect in your home? What if you're striving for peace? What does it do to the relationships that God has given to us? I came across a really cool story as an artist, a professor at the University of Syracuse. It was really interesting to me because he did this project that I think encompasses and illustrates just as we end and we finish up today. He did something called the Franken Tree there in, in, at that university. And what he did was he heard about that the state of, North, of, uh, of New York was going to be bulldozing an orchard of stone fruits. Now, I didn't really know what stone fruits, uh, I didn't know what that was, but it's all like plums and, and, and peaches and all these different things. But they had what would be called an ancient orchard. They had fruits that went back thousands of years. And they had all of those trees there at the University of Syracuse in this orchard. And they were going to bulldoze the whole thing. And he was mortified. This professor was absolutely mortified. He has the, kind of the coolest name ever. His name was Sam Van Aken. And so what he decided to do was something kind of crazy. He loved botany. That was something that was a hobby of his. And so he decided that he would find the tree with the strongest trunk and the deepest root system. And he would start grafting. When he was done, he had grafted this Franken tree with 40 different fruit bearing trees. And you're going to see an artist's rendering of what it looks like in bloom. And he took all of these different trees and he put them together. And now there are, I think there are 15 of these now in the United States. All over. They bear fruit. All of them have preserved essentially a whole orchard in a single tree. I loved this idea. This was so cool. And he did an amazing interview on CBS Evening News a couple years back where he talked about this, this project became something biblical to him because grafting has such massive uh, over and undertones, I would say, that spiritually for each one of us, and he had connected into that. This tree had 40 different trees put into it. And the reason it worked was because the root system was so strong. The support system of the trunk was so strong. It was a type of plum. And I thought, that is so perfect. That illustrates exactly what I'm saying. Because of this, spiritually, your spiritual DNA is rooted in Jesus Christ. He is the roots. It provides support and sustenance. That's what the sacrifice on the cross is about in rescuing and redeeming us as people. The trunk is strong enough. The strong enough for all of us. And you see those branches that come out. And you see what God has done. And the connectedness of the family of God. Where he has brought people from every tribe, of every race, of all these languages. And he has brought us together as a family. And because of Jesus Christ, because of his sinless life and his sacrifice, we have hope and we are grafted in with all different people. That's who we are today. I encourage you with this. I believe Paul is encouraging us under the inspiration of God. Is to know who you are. To know where you came from. To know that your relationship with other people means something. That God is holy and he loves us. And he has called us into a relationship with him. And that means something very important. I pray today that your eyes are open, that your heart is open more to what it means to be part of his family and your spiritual DNA. Let's pray.
Dear Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the way you care for us. Father, thank you for your mercy and your grace in each one of our lives. Father, we are grateful people. Lord, I pray that we're more humbled, that we're more honest and self-aware. Lord, that we know that our identity is not based off of our past, but rather our identity is based on what you did on the cross. Lord, thank you for calling us. Thank you for connecting us. Father, thank you so much that we are grafted in in this beautiful picture. Lord, thank you so much that we are rooted not in our works, but rather in yours. Father, thank you for the way you've cared for us and the way you've loved us. Lord, help us to take the admonishments, the encouragements, the challenge of Paul and be humble people that care for others. We ask all of these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.